and I, I think that kind of you asked where 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 the passion or the addiction comes from, and it's or, or or how do you go from being the guy that says, I don't know, it feels different, to I'm I'm able to say, well, to me it feels like the bevel's a bit too sharp here, but it's probably a balance between the width profile at 41 is stopping the ski from rolling versus the tail width at nine when we have kind of a pressure balance whereas if maybe we could you know it, it becomes kind of like the matrix movie when you're when you see you see them look at the screen and it's just zeros and ones but they're really seeing pictures and it, it went from me you know that first time skiing with bob to looking at the screen and it being like the matrix and i'm looking at it through the tv and like yeah it doesn't it's just numbers. just numbers doesn't mean anything but now i can i'm, I'm getting better and I've, I've i've experienced quite a lot of stuff to where i'm actually starting to see pictures and the picture can come from feeling so i can you know i can i can ride on the ski and most times like don't tell me anything about the skis let me ride it and i can normally pick out some things I like or don't like about it or a direction to go without the information. Everyone, welcome back to the Water Ski Podcast for episode 37, which is part three and last part of my interview with Will, Will Asher. So I know I say this all the time, but I really can't avoid saying it even more so today. I'm stoked to release this. Um, it's currently 1.17 a.m. in Italy. I just came back from a day of work at the lake, but I really need to get this out for you guys to enjoy uh, and will here covers a lot of what i think the water ski world is eager to know about will uh, particularly when it comes to his passion for ski design and even more depth into what he sees his journey to be so far and in the future in the years ahead uh, some of the recent changes he's made I think you guys are just simply going to be uh, mind blown from this one and, and enjoy it. And let me know what you think. Let Will know what you think about this. Uh, follow him on Instagram, shoot him a message, let him know that you're enjoying it. Um, or shoot me a message to my email, matteo at thewaterskipodcast.com. Um, this episode is once again brought to you by the Flowpoint Method. So by now you should know Flowpoint Method, brand new online water ski training program developed by Jenny Lebeau and Marcus Brown. Yeah, that guy dreads, is good at skiing, you know, knows a ton. And finally he's sharing a ton. The amount of material that you learn and cover and practice, especially in the Flowpoint Method is just uh, remarkable. Honestly, I haven't seen anything like this. I don't think there has been anything like this. Um, covers technique, fitness, nutrition, mindset. Truly a first when it comes to a holistic approach to life on the water. Um, I love it. I think they have the right approach. And as you might have heard before, that's why I'm collaborating with them on the mindset section of the flow point method. With daily, weekly updates, an extremely extensive of library of videos, instructionals, and writings, you can finally remove all the guesswork and get the most out of your time of, on the water. And really what I love about the program, which you can now try for free for three days, is the fact that it's sectioned into pre-season, season, post-season, post and off-season, really stressing the importance of periodization. Um, you can become a member of the Flowpoint Method and support the Waterski Podcast by going to thewaterskipodcast.com slash flowpointmethod, one word. So again, thewaterskipodcast.com slash flowpointmethod or click on the link in the show notes. Also, this podcast is brought to you by you, the listeners. Uh, 
the donations, the emails, the messages, the calls, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, this is a work of love, love for the sport. By now, love, I guess, for the uh, passion of bringing people's stories out. Um, so, no, thank you so much to everyone who listens, who has been listening from episode one. I know there's quite a few of you guys out there. Um, thank you so much. Okay, enough the chatter. Let's get to part three of my interview with Will. Enjoy. Yeah. Um, now tell me, because Bob has said this story oh, like oh, a few times over the years of how when you guys started skiing together, you weren't probably the best uh, testing guy out there, right? Yeah. Well, tell me your version. <clears throat> like what were those first days like testing stuff with, with, with Bob? Because I'm assuming just by virtue of, the, of your journey, of your experiences with Andy, now it was Candyland. Like you had a guy that knew how to, to tinker with skis yeah. and you had almost by virtue of your job, the access to try a lot of stuff. Like, was that an exciting time for you? How was it? It was, it was exciting, but it was kind of confusing a little bit because I would, um, at that point I wasn't that much of a tinker. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had, he had filed on a ski or whatever. I'd done this thing, but it wasn't much, you know, it was like a little bit, not much. Right. You know, it was more changing the fins, bindings, I'm playing with bindings a lot, but, um, so I didn't have a whole ton of experience as far as like testing skis or changing from one ski to another and how it feels and what needs to be changed and what's happening under the feet. I would, I would just basically do it when I was younger by skiing a lot and changing the fin a lot and keeping notes and that kind of stuff. But then when Bob came in the boat, it'd be kind of like, you know, I was the beginner, beginner, beginner. And then I have this guy that's got 30 years of solid ski testing all the way back from the wood days, asking me questions that I didn't even know were questions. Right. And, you know, he would just be saying, well, what do you, what's happening with the pressure on the ski here? Or is it bending like this? Or do we need to be stiffer there? Or I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like, it's like, pfft, like right, right. right away, head blown. I think my head was so blown, I wasn't even able to ski. And I'll be like, I don't know, it just feels different. Yeah, that's I'm what like, he said you were saying. I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, This the, as broad as my knowledge is, I mean, you got to think back to skiing with like Ferraro and, and Rini and some of these guys, I was, I was more made to be like a robot than to be a self thinker. Mm -hmm. It was almost discouraged over the last couple of years to not be a thinker in yeah. a way. And even, you know, when I first got with HO, it was very much, I was the, you know, I was bottom of the barrel as a young kid, I was the rookie coming in. You got Wade, you got Sully, Eddie, Rossi. They were like the main main guys in there. Right. So then suddenly, fast forward a couple of years, they've all left. There's Dave, me, Bob, CP, Wade. And we're at Wade's and I'm being asked all these questions. It's like, I should know what I'm doing because I'm, you know, I'm world champion. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that's what probably Bob might have struggled with at the beginning, right? Like, all, he has Will Asher in front of him. He has already won Worlds, like, great skier. Yeah. But he can't tell me what he feels on the ski, yeah. which I guess for someone like him and his brother who their skiing journey was tied in with tinkering with skis, yeah. to him it must have been unthinkable, right? Like how think, can he not feel things? Yeah, I think or, so. Or how can he not verbalize them, right? You certainly felt different, but you couldn't really answer his questions, right? Yeah. To him it must have been confusing. Yeah, I was like, well, well, when I when I take my speed on the gauge <laughs> and I have two hands long and attack, the ski doesn't work. So what else you got for me? <laughs> You know, <laughs> I, did, I was like, that's all I had. Right, right. I mean, I had feel. I had, you know, we we played a lot. So I think I was able, I was really able to take something that maybe didn't work and then make it work in a way. Like I was able to have the athleticism. Um, like you were adapting to the piece of carbon underneath you, but that then it didn't necessarily mean it was a better, like towards the right direction or better yeah, ski. Or, yeah. yeah, and if my ski changed, it's because I got on the newer model of the ski. Mm -hmm. you know from year to year it wasn't like i was implement instrumental in making the the gains on a ski yeah so was, you know for a lot of years it was well that ski looks like it's skiing really well let's get that ski or you know that that kind of thing right so then working with bob it became pretty clear pretty quick that maybe i had to do some things because we were essentially a brand new ski company um bob wasn't you know he wasn't skiing he he, he was already long retired 
very passionate, but he's like, this is on you guys. Like, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to work to, to figure, figure this out. I'll be here and I'll, he's like, I'll put in the work from my side. I'll put in the blood, sweat and tears and I'll give you, I'm opening up my knowledge bank and we're, we'll do everything we can, but you know, we got to get this ball rolling. You got to be committed doing your part of the job. Yeah. I mean, like kind of hats off the weight and, you know, he's like, well, here's, here's like my flex pattern that, saw me through my career and this is where I got to and so we were able to use like his knowledge and where he had gotten and we were able to talk about some of the skis he had had in the past and and use that to kind of springboard forward you know so we can go back to the Dave could go back to the factory had the old molds he could he could then start to build layups because he didn't have any of that Mm. like when he got there I mean I don't really want to tell Dave's story but it's like as he would say he he got to the factory and he'd ask people what his job is and he's like you're the boss man like no one else here knows what your job is you got to make it up right so he had to figure out you know how do you build a ski how do you put a piece of foam in a mold how do you build a mold how do you what's a layup what's the resin carbon ratio all this stuff right and i think that transition couldn't have come at a better time for me in my career because i was given what Dave is really good about is, is, is communicating with people and have, have them come along with him on the journey. So what he's always been great with me is if something comes up, he'll call me and he'll want to talk about it. And, and if he has an idea, he'll talk through it. And he's, he's never been a guy to, if he has an idea, it's my idea. And you're just the guy that's going to ski on the ski eventually. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's always been very inclusive. I don't know if you felt that too with him. On absolutely. The team. Yeah, absolutely. And I see it with everybody on the team. Like he treats everyone equally. And he, um, yeah, he's, he's told me a lot about that. But, um, so I went from being super green and the, let's say the transition from, from that greenness and not really, being able to express what I was feeling came from working with Bob, but probably more just because of proximity would be working with Chris. Mm -hmm. So I was in, I was in Orlando and I was speaking to Bob on the phone. I'm like, man, I I think we really need to do this. Or he was like, yeah, I think we should do this, whether it's a width change on a ski or a rocket change or a bevel or a flex. Because Bob is based in in California, obviously. Bob's in Truckee. Yeah. I was like, you know, we kind of need to do it now. He's like, well, the best thing you can do is, you know, go see my brother, go see KLP. I was like, I didn't really, I didn't know KLP at all. You know, he's like, don't worry about it. I'll call him. You go over there. He'll sort it out. And first time with KLP, we hit it off like big time. Right. Like the amount of time I spent with that guy working on skis is unbelievable. Yeah. Nicole would always say, if I, if you didn't come back smelling like carbon and sweat, I would think you're cheating on me. Because right. it'll be Chris and I in his shed until three o'clock in the morning, grinding on skis, cutting on skis, figuring out ways to manipulate the stuff that we wanted to happen on a ski. Mm-hmm. Interesting, because so then it became from like a, you know, I guess being green as you call it and not being able to express it to them being given yet another opportunity to learn more, mm. and you just went full on, right? Like oh, I mean, man, I was like a sponge. Right. Like I was a dry sponge being thrown into a lake <laughs> and uh, I'm uh, probably the only way I could, I could explain how it felt would be, you know, you're watching a, a pantomime or a theater like live show. And then, you know, you got all the puppets in the foreground, but then someone lifts the curtain from behind. You see all the inner workings and all the people pulling the strings. Right. That's pretty much how it felt to me. You know, I, I would, I'd just seen a, a ski, and I'd, I'd always heard stories of, you know, you cut one down the middle and left ski was a D3 and the right ski was an O'Brien. I was like, what the hell is that even? That's, that's not a thing. Like, right. How does it stay together? Why, how doesn't it break? So, we, I mean, essentially, I came at the right time for Chris and it was just like, we just hit it off. Yeah, so any, any obviously... I don't know KLP very well, but it seems to me that like he kind of took you under his wing and said, say, okay, let me show you what I know in a sense. Yeah. And then you guys started exploring together. Yeah. So you had obviously that, that great, great side of things. But was it, 
like what were you e what were you eager to learn in those days was it the actual manual aspect of it like how do you modify or was it more about like to express it verbally or do the two things go together like there's no you, you know what i mean yeah um he has progressed along the way a lot i mean to start with i was really curious like how do you change the flex on a ski like that just seemed super complicated to me or how do you change the width on the ski mm -hmm. that that kind of stuff um i know that's that was like the first thing we did was a flex change it's like i needed to be stiffer under the back foot so i get a bit more acceleration right and went over there and chris like basically showed me how to do it you know he didn't have to he could have been like well leave the ski with me you know you know i'll give it to you tomorrow or next right. week but he didn't he he like opened his arms and opened basically gifted me a whole world that you never would have been able to learn by yourself like i, I never in a million years would have learned the things that chris and bob have taught me right over the last 10 15 years like there's no there's no way i could have i mean once you've done it it's kind of simple but until you've done it it's like there's no way you would have dreamt that up it doesn't even matter and it's and and to be able to work with chris like especially what i know now chris chris has done more with skis than anybody else in the world mm -hmm. so take me bob andy you you name it anyone you can think of that's done something to a ski in that that regard nick parsons you know yeah. add, add them all in the mix chris has done more than all of us combined that's so crazy it's just and i i just say that because i i know like the stuff we did you know f for the years that we worked together and you know just tinkered and messed around with stuff he hasn't slowed down and he's been doing that since he was 13. so he's done that his whole life right and he's you know he's always been known as like the doctor of skis and the, all, all those different things yeah now le let me ask you this because like i have the feeling you know i have a lot of friends that are not water skiers right and i'm trying to make them understand the importance of equipment in our sport mm, okay right and the way i've kind of tried to explain it is i feel we are in a little bit in the middle between say snow skiing snow skis and surfboards right so surfboards if you look at all the pros they will tell you who shaped their board yeah right, right? like so who who was the person first and last name that actually put the hands on and created that board then you have snow skiing which is like you know millions of euros or dollars put in wind tunnels super engineering like and people that are employed to test that stuff right yeah, yeah. and i feel we're kind of in the middle like we mm -hmm. I, particularly they show we you know with dave like we have a very fairly numeric engineering mindset of how we're making the skis but at the end of the day, you know, there's a bit of that hand car, like hand crafting, you know, like mm -hmm. I feel we're kind of in the middle. I don't know. Yeah, it's. Yeah, we. Hmm. I mean, I, I'd always say that Bob is the master shaper, like Bob can work on a ski and he's like. If he works on a ski, he could change every single thing on it and he could change it in a way to where he could sell it the next day he's a the guy's a craftsman mm -hmm. um but as far as like i say we're more like formula one as far as like how how much these things change the performance of the vehicle or the ski you know our, our boats basically our, our ski is the car mm -hmm. and it, it's you know looking at every aspect of it and it you could see just you know this kind of long skinny thing but there's infinite things that can be changed on it and they b because we're dealing with water and not with air the pressure is so much greater that it has a bigger influence on on the vessel on the ski on the ship right we're going fast and we have water so the pressures that are involved are, are crazy i mean we take um like 400 grit sandpaper and swipe it a couple of times it can go from being skiable to unskiable or unskiable to skiable yeah and that's somewhat the addiction and i was saying it to bob the other day i was i was working on a ski and i i think it was even the ski i rode last year i changed something with the flex and it didn't come out how i wanted to 
but I skied on it anyway. And then that was like the difference between the ski being, you know, one or two at 41 or running 41. And I said to him, like, how do we ever hit the bullseye? You know, when, when it's just something that finite and that small that made all the difference between it being average middle of the pack to, hey, maybe I have a little bit of an advantage here again. Right. And the, the battle in this sport is how do you get that competitive advantage? Because right now the competition is so fierce. Um, what did he say? I don't know. Keep, keep trying. Work, keep trying. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that kind of asked where, where, where the passion or the addiction comes from. And it's, or, or, or how do you go from being the guy that says, I don't know, it feels different to I'm, I'm able to say, well, to me, it feels like the bevel's a bit too sharp here, but it's probably a balance between the width profile at 41 is stopping the ski from rolling versus the tail width at nine when we have kind of a pressure balance whereas if maybe we could you know it, it becomes kind of like the matrix movie when right. you're when you seeing you seeing them look at the screens and it's just zeros and ones but they're really seeing pictures and it, it went from me you know that first time skiing with bob to looking at the screen and it being like the matrix and i'm looking at it through the tv and like yeah it doesn't it's just numbers just numbers doesn't mean anything but now i can i'm, I'm getting better and I've, I've i've experienced quite a lot of stuff to where i'm actually starting to see pictures mm -hmm. and the picture can come from feeling so i can you know i can i can ride on the ski and most times like don't tell me anything about the skis let me ride it and i can normally pick out some things i like or don't like about it or a direction to go mm -hmm. without the information right are you picking up also like I guess with your experience both as a skier and as a you know tester develop, develop ski development are you able to blindly pick out pick up what is changing that ski so I give you a piece of carb and it says B you yeah. know and you skied on A for the last two weeks yeah. are you able to tell me yeah probably this is softer on the tail or this is like a little narrower tail obviously without taking the calipers out are, are you getting to that point yeah somewhat somewhat it depends how close it is if if you're taking like omega and you give me omega a b c d and you know each one of them is different or there's layup or stuff that's it's not always the easiest thing to feel yeah. but if you can take a b c d and you've changed a width profile or a bevel or even a rocket to a certain extent that's easier to feel because okay. that's really changing the characteristics of a ski mm -hmm. but as far as flex you may feel a bit more acceleration here or deceleration there or maybe um, it folds on you at the end of the turn. It's like, well, that's too soft. Or, right. or maybe if, if it folds at the wrong part of the turn, it's too stiff. You know, so it, it, if you go from one end, th there's always like two ends of the spectrum. So you've, say for flex, you've got too soft, too stiff. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in the middle is hopefully pretty good. But it, you can sometimes, if you're too stiff or too soft, the feeling's going to feel the same in a way. So it's... It's like if it's too soft, you maybe you finish the turn, the ski folds on you. Right. So it, you know, it it bends too much and creates that bend in the ski, and that's like the shit. It's too soft. I need more support. But then sometimes it can be so stiff that it won't bend around the corner, creates a pressure build. It'll break you, and it feels like the ski's folding. Mm -hmm. So it's it only comes like the only way I've been able to work through it is is having the feelings with. I'd say like other people around me with positive reinforcement as far as the information that I'm feeling and they're saying, yes, I'm seeing it too. Mm -hmm. Or be, being able to kind of hold my hand along the way. Yeah, it kind of goes back to what um, I was telling Marcus when we were in California, like how sometimes even just those three days we were skiing together and say whoever was on the water, you could tell they were having a good feeling yeah. and they would come back on the dock and say, oh yeah, that was good. But then sort of try to verbalize it, as Benny has said before, becomes hard. Like, what was it? Like, I felt good. This yeah. felt, you know, but verbalizing it becomes a little bit harder, no? And, it, and it's so hard because um, it's, it's easy to verbalize it if you've done it before and you feel it. But at a certain point, we're at the point where we're trying to do and feel things we've never done or felt before. Right. And that's where it kind of gets really hard and confusing because it's, 
is coming up with a direction that you want to go. And this will normally come from a conversation with Bob or Dave or Wade or Marcus or you or whoever, John, Benny, like it'll come up and it'll be like, okay, well, it, it's become pretty clear that this is the part of the course where we're not making ground and, you know, this is where we're losing it. So we kind of put the effort, the, the focus into that. And um, it's, it becomes a lot, yeah, it becomes a lot easier to do when you have that focus. Mm -hmm. But if you if you don't have the focus and you don't necessarily see a clear path to the future, you can just end up going down some rabbit holes that can lead you there for years. I've been down rabbit holes for years. Yeah. I mean, in the like 11, 12, 13, 11, 12, 2011, 12, 13, just uh, I went on searching missions. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I didn't see a way I was going to, be successful with the stuff I was doing. So it's like you gotta, you gotta find new ways. Right, right. Yeah, and and I guess that that just for the audience that might not understand the complexity of this, I think you verbalized it very well. You went down rabbit holes for years. Yes. That's how complex this is, you know, like because mm -hmm. you have all these variables. Just let's stay with equipment. Okay. Let's just say you weren't a competitor. Like your job was solely to develop a ski for HO and you're good enough that you can do it, but you're not, you don't have competitions. You don't have anything else. Your job is to create the equipment. The variables in that are already enough to send you down rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. And then you pile up the fact that, you know, you are a competitor and you have to perform on the day and you have to train. Like all of a sudden it becomes really easy to go down rabbit holes, which sometimes they'll lend you to wonderland. Sometimes <laughs> they won't. Right. <laughs> It's true. Yeah. And it's really true. And you don't, sometimes you don't even know you're in, you don't know if you're in wonderland or hell. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you won't know until you, you've, you've actually finished your set and it can come, you can, um, you can have like the, the Jesus sets, like the first and, and Bob, <laughs> Bob was like, he named my skis Betty and Betty Lou. So back in the day, my A1 was, was Betty. That's, yeah. that's like the one I rode for a long time when I won 09 Worlds, Masters 8, 9, 10 was on Betty. But it's like, you don't, <laughs> um, you don't, you don't know a girl until you've been on a few dates with her. So she doesn't show the first personality for the first two, three dates. She'll show up on like the 10th, 11th date. Good analogy. Um, so that was kind of why I, my ski got called Betty. But <laughs> it's like, and it's true. You can, I could go out here and I could probably pull one of these skis out of the shed where I know it's, it's a road, it's a road to hell. But maybe first set, I could probably go out there and do amazing things on it. But it's the, it's the little things and it'll, it'll show up on that first date. It'll be there. It'll be a, it'll be a twitch or it'll be a, Maybe I'm, I'm able to turn two, four really well and get good line out at one, three, but then maybe there's just, just something midway through the turn that just, you know, but I'm coming off a ski that has confidence. Mm -hmm. Like right now I'm skiing pretty well and I know I can, I can roll that confidence into another ski and it'll be there for a few dates. Right. And it might even, because the, the two is better on this new ski, it might take me beyond where my ski is. But because it's such a bitch on, on one, three, eventually that starts to manifest and that starts to take over and then I lose confidence in my two and then that one, three thing just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Right. And it's, it's such a weird thing. And I've, I've felt, I've fallen into that trap many times that actually got me at, um, 2007 worlds. Same thing. I was skiing on a ski. I was trying something with the tail. We'd cut it, but I hadn't, and like rounded the trailing edges on the ski and and where i when i've been skiing i've been skiing in like pretty nice conditions it's pretty flat and it kind of creates a tension through the ski so i had I had almost like a because the tension was more consistent through the ski it kind of held better uh -huh. i had to create a nice fast turn with that sharp tail I'm like this is great we got the world's first round a little bit windy but it wasn't like too windy i was able to make it through the final to scrap through the finals is quite a bit more windy and just that extra release of pressure through the tail blew the tail. 
Mm. But it's it's like the little things that over it's, it's taken you know 15 years of dancing with the devil yeah pretty <laughs> in a, much in a way yeah and you told me like not too long ago you were telling me how there's part of the skis as you said you take you know 400 grid and you just do yeah and the skis like either unskiable or skiable and then there's other parts of the ski where you can bond or like go a little bit more yeah. you know attack mode and you barely feel the difference yeah so e yeah. there's even that part of like where where are those parts like you know and then maybe in different skis there are different parts like exactly oh Chang God. changes from ski to ski based on lots of different things whether it's width or rock or make different parts of the ski more critical so but here's my question though and i don't know if it's just like a marketing thing but you can finally answer this question i've had for a long time you've been at the show since 2005 four or five yeah right the only ski that has your name on it is the a3 yeah why uh i i don't know if i can say well if you can't say then don't i'll say, say it. it fuck it um another skier that i respected greatly got sued because his name was on a ski and his ski broke. Mm. And then he was named in the lawsuit because his name was on the ski. I may be hashing up all the details completely. But it was kind of like a risk reward thing of not having the name on it. Right. Interesting. Because, mm. I mean, I would assume <clears throat> all the work you put into these things, right? Eventually, it'd be, especially if you had a, a high. Um, involvement into a shape that a show release yeah. releases it seems almost like a, a pride you know like hey this is will asher design right yeah and that's so i was wondering why it hadn't happened since i mean that, maybe that's part of it and then um for for me yeah I, I have my hand in it and i mean maybe it's a bigger part of the hand than some other people but it's still for me is a team effort you know, it's not always completely my idea that goes into a ski, especially okay. more now than before. Okay. Like I require, I rely heavily on the team around me and I trust the team around me. Like, um, Bob has had more hands in the Omega than I had, you know, I, I had my input and, you know, it was based on something we'd done in the past and it was kind of like a revisit then a tweak. And then it, you know, it, it got pieced together, but we've, we've, grown in a way together that I I don't know if I could like sit here and say that was my ski and have my name on it in okay. a way I mean sure for, okay we're not even talking about business now we're just talking maybe for business it would be nice to have a name on it and maybe it would sell more skis but I don't know I think I think the selling of the team has more power for me than my ego being on that ski yeah yeah, and be, I'd be curious to ask Dave when I'll get him in front of the mic what yeah. he thinks about that. That might be know? a better one for Dave because he, he he studies all this stuff too. Like he's, you know, he he looks into business and sales, and he, you know he's got his finger on the trigger for stuff like that. Yeah, um, I'm not incentive based. That's not my my contract isn't, you know, sales incentive based. Right. I, I never went that way. No, um, but yeah, and and I think there's a there's a very interesting conversation to be had about the business side of something like this yeah but i was more interested in in the personal side in your side right? yeah like so from... yeah so my personal side is is i couldn't do this without bob or dave especially wade yeah. yourself yeah marcus john benny um jamie ali you know the whole team nick right. adams rob the rookies we, right. need, we need someone to go out there and ski six or seven times in a day because i can't do it Right. But f for me, um, I, I realized a couple of years ago that I, I wasn't I had, I felt like I had good ideas, but I wasn't able to, it needs to open it up. It need to be, definitely needs to be a team thing mm -hmm. and working with Bob, you know, he, he has his things that he's very stubborn and passionate about. Right. And I, me too. Like, uh, we, you know, we butted heads plenty of times, you know, my ego takes over, his ego takes over and we end up, you know, fuck you, whatever. Right. Right. Never, it never like, 
but I think that's part of our passion and our um, how much we care about this project. Like he's like, he believes this and I believe this. But then, you know, I'd say over the last five years anyway, like, you know, we, our relationship gets stronger and it's great. We're able to hash these things out. So, okay, well, let's, let's do it. Let's test through it. You know, I'll go your way, you go my way. We'll test them both out. Best case scenario, we, we, we have a hybrid of the two. We prove one wrong or one right. right. Either way, I don't care. I'd rather, I'd, I'd just as well be wrong as I would be right. Because mm -hmm. that means we progressed. Yeah. And, and I think it must be exciting for you to be working for a company that, that has created that culture, right? <laughs> like, because, I mean, let's face it, we've said it several times. I don't, there's, any, there's nobody that has cut as many molds as HO has. No. Right? I mean, so, like, like, I, like I say, when I, you know, when Dave started at HO, couldn't have happened, I couldn't have been more fortunate to be in that position that I was at at that time. I mean, the perfect storm for me. Right. Um, someone new comes in, they're as passionate about learning as I am. Like Dave is as passionate as I am, if not more. Mm -hmm. Bob is, you know, Bob's still Bob. Right. Even though, you know, 50 years later. Still wants to figure it out. I was on the phone to him earlier today. Oh, there you, you know, go. I sent him videos on my set. I'm like, you know, he has an idea about it. We'll try it. You know, I can, I can build it myself because they've, they've given me the tools to do it. Mm -hmm. But even though, you know, I, I could probably like fuck Bob, you know, I can go and do it myself. I, I now, or I know that I need him. You know, it, he's an integral part of my process and our process as a team. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's valuable, valuable to it. But it, I mean, this is all going to come full circle to 2009 worlds was kind of the first worlds of, or the, or the second year, first full year of the first gear we created as a HO team. So 2007 was the first time I got a prototype. Didn't go very well. It was like kind of an offshoot of a Monza. We had changed the width, changed the bevels, but with those some limitations with the Monza, we couldn't really fix. Mm -hmm. And then 2008, you know, the, the kind of legend of Bob building that ski, getting stuck in the mold, right? Sledgehammer out, I ski on it, Moomba, which becomes like the prototype for what became the A1. Right. And then the A1 was what the A1 was. You know, exactly. the most phenomenal ski, groundbreaking. And that was essentially HO's first ski, if you think about it. Yeah, like yeah of the new team, right? Of the new generation at yeah, HO, for, right? For Dave Wingerter at the head, Bob LaPointe, you know, Master Shaper, me. Yep. That was essentially the, the first year of our team. So we're 12 years old. Well, I, I certainly have fond memories of that, and I've, I've explained that before, yeah. like of how... I skied on a on a ski that really wasn't working for me in 2008, and then I ended up smashing it on a tree at Jay's, and then the following spring, well, then I got into the off season downtown Lafayette, you know, all of that, <laughs> and then Fuck. in the spring, Jay came and told me, "Hey, there's this new ski that HO did." Uh, spring, Bob spring 2009, 2008, 2009. Yeah, okay. For me, uh, spring 2009, and he said, "Hey, there's this new ski." Bob Lapointe. What ski were you on before that? Uh, yeah, it was a D3. Okay. I had one season on a D3. Okay. Um, yes, you probably weren't looking outside your box, really. Well, I, I actually, that D3 was looking outside the box in, in my experience at the time. Okay. Because I, I was skiing on the, um, and this will make a lot of sense, so you was skiing on a 6M. And I did very well on the 6M. Oh, yeah. Uh, Fabio Yanni convinced me to use it. Hmm. And then... But that ski was getting really soft really easily. Mm. So luckily I had a deal with the O'Brien dealer in Italy to, to get access to them at a decent price. Yeah. And then I said, ah, let's try something else. And I had this season with this D3 that really didn't work for me. And, uh, and the following year, Jay saw my frustration and said, hey, try this. Bob mm. Lapointe did it. Has a lot of similarities to what you used to like. Give yeah. it a shot. And that ski really was one of the skis that changed my my skiing you know dave says it all the time like there's sometimes that piece of equipment or that bit that makes you jump these super hard steps yeah the a1 was was that for me yeah. really you know i had run 39 on the on the 6am but like uh, once or twice with the a1 i started running it right i started running it that was a phenomenal ski i mean that I mean, it, it came from a generation of edge-to-edge -edge concave. So, you know, 
it was kind of like the good D3, Monza, O'Brien. Like, basically, the, the rails had gone away. Right. You know? and, and Bob, Bob, it just kind of blew his mind. He's like, well, why didn't you guys have rails on the ski? You know, <laughs> right. it was like just kind of like one of those no, no-brainers. Like, why did, what do you mean you have gas in the car? You know, it was like, what do you mean you don't have rails on the ski? Right. And, you know, what do you mean you got a narrow tail? Like, you got to have this, you know, you got a white tail, big bevels. You know, and that's what he knew. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, he had it in his head and he put it on paper and that was the A1. And, fuck, A1's legendary. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, that was one of the big steps when I, cause, I mean, before that was Monza and they went basically straight to A1. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm in the right place. This is good. In terms of, you know, the uncertainties you had by staying at HO or in terms of your own skiing now you're in a good place everything everything I was home uh huh yeah everything everything just seemed I had had access to the right people um, which was super fortunate to have that that position you know to have Bob on speed dial basically I think he's like number two or three you got you know, <laughs> Nicole my mom then Bob right or I think Dave might be above you know that's that's kind of the hierarchy of phone calls that I have that's cool um, hey Nicole you're still number one you're doing well she's good she's number one <laughs> yeah um, but it um, so you were at home I was at home yeah and yeah. that was around the time of Canada Worlds yeah yeah so that was 2009 so you know it had basically a season on the A1 then going into 2009 Worlds I was in a completely different place she's in you know 2005 was before Bob had said I, I, when Bob asked me what's wrong what can we change what do you feel in the ski I was like I don't know it feels different that was in 2006 so you know I was already world champion so then between 2006 and 2009 we'd started to build that rapport I'd been able to work with Chris yeah LaPointe quite a bit spend the hours in the shed we'd cut skis up we'd done all this stuff and we got to a place which yeah started <laughs> well, I mean, just looking at your face it must be a great memory I mean and I think the difference is you showed up as you said like, like in Canada not only knowing that you could win this thing uh, but also knowing that the ski you had under your feet you had an integral part in developing mm. I mean I'm, I'm, I'm sure that was a first right that was the first yeah. time really for you I mean I I'm, I wouldn't take any credit for the A1 that was all Bob Bob okay. and Dave, so I'm not going to sit here and say that, but I did know the numbers on the ski for the first time. Like, I was aware of, like, the width profile. I was aware of the rocker. I was aware of the flex. Okay. I knew the bevel size. I knew the radius. I knew the... All, all those little things that before were nothing to me. I was, like, more concerned about the graphics. Well, this one looks cool. Like, kind of gave me a good feeling. I knew I could run buoys and then I could make it work. Right, right. That, that was where I was before 2009. So yeah, okay. So maybe not you. You had an integral part in creating, but certainly now, as you said, you had the knowledge of what was under your feet. Yeah. Well, that's that's a different yeah. situation than 2005, it's right? Completely different because it's it's one thing to do it when you're green, and all you have to think about is two hands long speed on the gates, mm -hmm. and that's like that's easy. There's no pressure. You're not. No one's necessarily. No one's really expecting anything from you. So it's. Um, that's kind of the easiest time to compete. But then when people start to expect stuff, it, it becomes pretty tricky. Yeah. It's a, it's a bit of a mind fuck. Like it, um, that pressure, like I, I, I didn't like that pressure. I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know how to live up to the expectation. Right. Of, you know, first couple of years is okay, but then it, it starts to feel like it weighs on you sometimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you said you wanted to circle back to the to the worlds in '09. Right. Um, so you won those pretty convincingly, three of forty-one. Um, what was that experience like? The first hour, the first week. Yeah, that was a that one felt really good. It was um, to to do it the second time and and to know what had had actually gone into it and have had a hands-on approach to every aspect of it you know, selecting the ski out of hundreds. <laughs> right. And going through diff different iterations of, you know, V1, V2 of the A1 and that kind of stuff. Um, it just felt more, 
more intentional maybe or more um to to maybe do it when you you think you might be able to do it instead of just kind of rolling the dice mm -hmm. is kind of a different process too i wish i could have gone through my whole career just rolling the dice you know not having to worry not having to stress or not having to have that pressure pressure right. on I think that's what Bob was saying, right? I mean, I'm sorry to go back to that, but I think that that's part of what Bob told you in terms of like consistency and maintaining it and, you know. Yeah, you get you end up getting more distractions as well, more commitments or more, you know, you get pulled this way or that way, whether it's a, you got to do a photo shoot here or you got to do, um, you know, an appearance here or you got to do, we know we're going to test this ski or we're going to do these other things now. It's, right. not, it's not just as simple as go ride the ski make sure it skis good and then you got you got a lot of things to bring you away from that yeah yeah so yeah. staying on, on the tournament side of things for a second um you told me in in 1.0 uh how masters for you is up there mm. and you want what five six yeah yeah five or six i think it's five five yeah well i guess we could count the trophies uh <laughs> yeah like uh Oh, 2008. <laughs> All right. So well, you won a few of these things. Yeah. And you told me that, like, to you, the Masters is up there. Yeah. Um, which I would agree a lot of skiers would say that. I mean, I, I'll tell you, like, for me, just to be able, like, I, I made, again, a lot of friends not in the ski world. I'm trying to make them understand it's our Wimbledon. It's our, you know, to me, just be able to say one time that I skied masters would be insane yeah. you know like it's like the pinnacle of the sport yeah um what was your like early experience at masters because you told me you, you skied what 16 in a row now like my first I skied junior in 2000 so I, I won junior masters and, yeah. and the fear is not the fear but it, it's not a given to go junior to open sorry yeah um yeah, because the top seven in the world make it. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's not, very it's exclusive. Yeah, it's not easy, yeah. And especially with the competition, how it's become, it's, it's harder now than it ever has been to make it to Masters. So yeah. um, it, it's always been super high for me just because, you know, you've got to qualify, you've got to get an invitation. There's only seven people to get the invite, you get there. And then to make the final, it's a super cut. You know, you've got to go from already there's only seven people make it and then that seven has to go to four. Yeah. And... It's never nice conditions. It's not an easy place to ski. Even when it's nice, it's not nice. Yeah. You know, that, that's not what the Masters is trying to be. You know, it's not meant to be nice. It's like, you know, this is the ultimate challenge. This is like level 10, bad guy. You know. Right. Um, so it, but, but just the, everything associated with the Masters, you know, you get the invite in the mail, you get the, you get the photo taken, you get the skiers meeting, and just everything is built up to something beyond just a regular tournament down the road. You know, it has that air about it, like the yeah, the prestige. Yeah. And so clearly that sound, seems to me something that you respect. Yeah, big you know? time. I mean, I, winning the Masters for the first time, I'd say, was probably one of my bigger wins as far as emotions and feelings and pride and just feeling on top of the world. Cause yeah. I, I'd, I'd seen the event. I had, I'd experienced it at a pro level as a junior, you know, watching it, you know, watching Andy do his thing and just knowing what it was, you know, you got the name on the board and you got the master's title winners and they count them every year. They the count 46th, them every year. The 47th. Yeah. My uncle had been master's champion back in the day. You know, jump champion, Mike right. Hazelwood. Um, yeah, so it was, it was just one of those. And it's the drive. It's the, you're in the spring and you got to drive up to Callaway Gardens and you get there and it it just all feels a bit special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you like that. I like that. Yeah. 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 Now, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like skiing there. Okay. Because it doesn't feel good. Yeah, no. But, I don't know. There's a lot of people that would say, "Oh no, yeah, Robin Lake. Uh, I enjoy. It feels easy." <laughs> I don't know that is. I don't anyone. think anyone's ever said that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Although, oftentimes you see some. Particularly, I was saying jump. Sometimes you see some gnarly performances at yeah. Robin Lake. I mean, I remember my second junior masters was the year that Freddie broke two thirty. Oh yeah. 
It was a world record done at the Masters, you know? They do it right. I mean, they, the boats are set up, the ramps, you know, it's a ramp they're familiar with. They tow it up there. The water's cold. It's fast. Yeah. And they'll change the ramp if it's a headwind. Yeah. yeah. So the reason why I'm asking you that is, and I don't know, this is a strange question, but I want to ask you anyway. Uh, the, the relationship with fame, and I know that in water skiing, especially the years that you came in and that I've been in, you know, the sport in terms of popularity has gone down, but there are skiers out there, you know, like, and you're one of the, the biggest names in skiing, right? So I'm sure that you go to a tournament, like your pro tournament with amateurs there, people want to get to know you, talk to you, ask you about skis, you know, like, how do you relate to that? Hmm. So weird. I don't, I don't feel famous at all. Like I don't, you know, but I, I mean, everyone that comes up to me, I, I see like the people I competed against when I was a kid. Like as I, as I climbed through the division four, three, two, one, I can relate to them all in a way. And I, and I, everyone, it doesn't matter what level you are, whether you're trying to run the slalom course or you're trying to run 41 off, like everyone has the same challenges and it's relative to the person. Right. So, I mean, is that kind of what you mean? Like, I, I I, never put myself above mentally. I don't think I'm any better than anybody. No, and I, I would regard. totally agree with that. Yeah. Certainly. So, it, for me, it's just, it's, I've never, like, built it up. I've never wanted to be famous. I've never wanted to be, like, some rock star that's popping champagne bottles. And, you know, yeah. I've, I've always liked to be kind of a low-key, humble guy mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, no, I mean, that, I would say that's, that's fairly clear, right? Like, yeah. Um, but I, I wonder if, I don't know, like it, maybe it's part of like the journey you've got into, right? Like if you, if you stayed that like rolling the die, you know, two hands long, fast at the gate and hmm. same ski for 15 years, maybe you would have turned into that. I don't know. Or maybe not because of your personality, right? but I don't I've, know. I've had, a I've had a particular focus throughout my career. Exactly. I guess like I was... I think it just comes back to being in the right place at the right time with the right people and just getting lucky a lot of it mm -hmm. but it, it's that but then it's also being willing to put the work in like I've, I've always been willing to put the work in I've always been willing to you know show up like if I'm if I'm going to commit to something I'm going to be in shape I'm, you know I'm going to want to work hard before I'll do the testing when it's yeah. time to do testing I'll I go to photo shoots when it's time to go to photo shoots i'll i'll do all the required stuff right um i forgot what you asked well yeah your relationship with fame and, and i think the reason why i asked it is that obviously as as a fan of the sport as i am i would love for someone like you or nate or freddie or mano regina to you know click on espn and i'm seeing you be yeah. giving an interview and actually being a little bored because you're giving so many interviews, kind of like a LeBron James kind of thing, you know, like where, okay, yeah. another one. I get you. So I think what's happening now is like the building block to what that could potentially become in the future. Like I'd, I'd say as far as the access that is happening these days, as far as your podcast with Marcus and the, the flow point stuff he's doing, um, it's giving an outside access to a, to a somewhat hidden world. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, through these long form podcasts, you get to like, see maybe inside the minds of some of the more weird people or interesting people in the sport. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, I think that's where it starts. Like you're, you're essentially building that foundation. You're, you're bringing people that maybe weren't in the sport but now are starting to get interested because they can latch on to say the personality of Nick Parsons or Manon or right. whoever, you know, whoever they can key into. And then I think it starts like that. It starts small and it, it's going to snowball over time. But it, this hasn't been in the sport ever. As far as I know, like there's never been an inside access to anything. Yeah. 
Yeah, and certainly technology helps, right? Like, and yeah. be more easier to create content nowadays. Yeah. But you know, I've seen I've seen online like you must have seen those 85, 87 tournaments on ESPN, you know, like... Yeah, Hot Summer Nights. You know, yeah. Hot Summer Nights, you know, like the tour on, Mastercraft tour on, on ESPN, like Bob to, pulling on shore after running 3 at 39 and giving an interview right away. Like he's yeah. taking his Mastercraft ski out. He runs out of his ski onto the shore. Yeah, exactly, yeah. even better. <laughs> he just grabs bindings. it and then there's ESPN microphone right yeah. away, you know, like... But they were, but at that time, they were the sport in the world. They didn't have skateboarding, motocross, BMX, snowboarding, snow skiing. Like, they were the pinnacle. They were the first extreme sport. Right. And they, I mean, those guys hit it at the right time. You know, Bob, Andy, Sammy, Carl, Wade, you know, they were in it in the heyday. Yeah. But then right away, the, you know, ESPN probably saw that skiing's getting all this popularity. So they're like, well, let's try this with other sports. And other sports came in, diluted the, the water a little bit. Yeah. And then eventually we just weren't able to hold the interest to keep it going. Yeah. Like we, we didn't progress enough as a sport or evolve enough to keep the interest going. And I think maybe, you know, some of the things that are happening now, different formats of events, fun little things because we're in quarantine and everyone's bored. Right. But something good, something good will come out of it. I mean, whether it's the 10 second trick pass that... Yeah, in tricks, yeah, yeah. I've got my trick ski set up. Like, I'm thinking about it. You know, I want to throw out a 10-second trick ski pass. Dude, I mean, Greg, if, if there wasn't a bigger compliment than that, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> hey, I'll pull you if you need a trick set. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to trick the next couple of days. But I'm saying, before this quarantine and before your podcast, Marcus, and stuff, Greg's, you know, starting to warm up, I, I, that thing's been collecting dust for f over five years. Right. But it's piqued my interest. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. like yeah but it's, it's it and i know i'm not the only one that that's done it too you know i, I think there's probably hundreds of people freddie's posting his trick runs right Corey's posting his trick runs right you know and maybe that got me excited to do it as well yeah but still it's it's something that's <clears throat> happened recently and it's i think for us in this moment it maybe feels small but if we keep this going i can imagine in five years we'll be we'll be there's a potential that we'll be talking back and be like, hey, remember we sat in the podcast and this and that? And yeah, I think that's how the momentum grows, but it comes from a different platform, and a different, just, just, a little, just a little tweak on what we're doing. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I think... It's exciting, actually. It is. It yeah. is. I, I really, I've said it several times, but I do see in the last two to three years, the sport kind of going back on an up, yeah. up direction. You know, like it 100%. might not be crazy, it might not mean exponential, but... I do see from, you know, a purely business side rather than federation member side, you know, rather yeah. than... Participation's up. Participation is up, yeah. you know, and we need that. Yeah. We need that all across the board. And I think you, you, we spoke about the complexity of ski design. I think question that, yeah, the right to say is a little bit more interesting to me personally or to someone like Marcus might be the growth of the sport. Yeah. And I think is equally as complex and multifaceted as you know coming up with a good shape of a ski to yeah. run buoys you know well yeah dave dave and marcus kind of took on the first project oh i mean dave all along it's like you got to grow the whole sport so if you want if you want non you know competition level skiers to become interested in the sport you've got to create something that they can actually ride right i mean you don't want to you don't want to send a beginner out on my ski. That's yeah. that's just not the way to do it. I mean, that's what a lot of companies do still. But that's I wouldn't say that's necessarily the the best experience they could have. Yeah. You know, the, for sure. the, the best experience for someone first getting on a slalom ski is going to be to ride the hovercraft. You know, you're going to you're going to get up. You don't have to take the boat very fast. You can cut through the wakes, you can create turns, you're going to be stable, you're going to have that Right off the bat, you're going to feel safe. Exactly. And you're going to get an amazing experience. You're going to be hooked from day one. And I'll, you know, we go to, one of the more fun things I do is to go to boat shows and you, you get exposure to these people and no one that comes through there really. I mean, one in 10 is going to be a buoy skier. Right. You know, a tournament, tournament skier or recreational or whatever. But most of them are like, hey, we've got a, an IO, inboard, outboard. 
my son weight boys, but I want to ski, blah, blah, blah. I've heard this story a million times where it's like, well, if the first ski you need to have is going to be the hovercraft. And I'm not selling you this ski because I think it's going to be a ski you're going to ride for a whole year or three years. I'm like, I'm selling you a ski because maybe you'll ride it 10, 20 times and progress into something better. But you've got to have that first experience. You've got to have that fun. You've got to get the bug and you've got to see there's something to it to where then you'll go to YouTube, watch some videos, see what else is out there. Yeah, exactly. Whereas if I sell you Omega day one, you're not going to have that. No, it's not you're not. That experience. You're not. And I think it's, it's so key. I think one of the things we learned along the way, well, particularly Marcus and, and Dave starting off with the free ride is the, the equipment, as you said, like there's a certain type of equipment that works well for the level that you're at. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and that might not necessarily be the Omega. You know, if you're, I mean, I'm thinking someone like you's trying, uh, there's a guy that skis with us who over the last few months went from not running the course to then run 26, 28, 30, and now he's taking a toll at running 32 miles per hour, oh, right? Yeah. And he was on a mid, like cross course ski. And then it became a point where, you know, he's like big guy, like almost six, four, I would say 200, 205. Yeah. And became, okay, now you need a bit of a bigger ski. You're trying to get into 36 miles per hour in, in the short term. We need to start making the jump to a higher level ski. Yeah. Right. Um, um, Omega. Yeah. Yeah. But then, the um the progression that he made wouldn't have been as fast if he went on omega right away no right yeah so it makes a lot of sense and then let's face it sometimes people go okay but this cost is x and this cost is 2x why yeah. don't i go on the 2x right away it must be better right yeah. but it doesn't really work like no, that it's, it's not about that it's about and 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 dave knows this so it's you know the like the, a lot of those skis are price pointed and it's price point in a way to get people into the sport and get them on and and the the particular especially the skis that are price pointed are the ones like that it's like the experience generators yeah you, know, you got the hovercraft or the omni especially which has been a phenomenal ski to sell like oh yeah just so so easy to sell but it's not it's not like we as salespeople are especially good it's the feedback we get from the customers as well it's like we jump on it the experience is good and even within that Omni, there's, you know, you can get the Omni straight, Omni carbon, Seneca Omni. Yeah. So you can go all the way in that one ski up to like basically the same construction as my ski. Right. But it enables them to get in it at a certain level. But also we're confident that they're going to progress to a certain level. And I'll tell them straight up. I'm like, it's a pretty easy sell. Like you qualify this, the buyer pretty quick. It's like, what do you do? It's like, well, I ski free ski. I've got a Malibu LX or a whatever, a small crossover boat. Yeah. And I'll maybe see buoys once in a while. So right away it's like, okay, well, you've mainly free skis. He has a potential to see buoys. So he doesn't need a hovercraft, doesn't need Omega because he's mostly free skiing. He's going to be straight into a Omni, but he's saying he's trying to get the buoys. So he doesn't need the baseline Omni. He needs carbon Omni. It's right. Like, it's like part of that simplicity of the whole line is what Dave's created. So then for the consumer, they can come in, plug themselves in, and they're almost guaranteed to have that experience yeah. because of it. Yeah, no, I think I think that part of our lineup is phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, I said it before, my dad, and you, you saw him ski on yeah. it. Like my dad is on a 69 Syndicate Omni. Yeah. You know, my dad can run 35 off. I mean, he's, he's a good skier, you yeah. know? Uh, but he needed that bigger platform, you know, and, and that worked amazingly. And what I loved about that, which kind of is connected to what you just said, Dave kept bugging me about it. Like, mm. how's your dad skiing? Like, yeah. is it good? Is he liking it? Have you talked to Will about setup? I'm like, yeah, 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 we're, we're getting it done. <laughs> but it goes to show how Dave really cares. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's got to be like... I mean, to me, it's been amazing to, to have your boss tell, like, caring that much right yeah that, i mean that doesn't surprise me at all that dave would have called and asked and yeah i mean that's who dave is he's he's as passionate about the guy riding the hovercraft as he is the you know the syndicate program right no for we, sure yeah for he, sure yeah and you can see it in the product but i mean we're not trying to make this a sales pitch today but no just, no no but, but it's, it, it's exciting because it's what 
also why I say I'm, I'm really lucky to be involved in this team is you have Dave and you got Marcus and Bob, but they're just, just to, um, they've taught me about the big picture. So I, for the longest time, I didn't give, didn't care about the burner or the triumph or whatever those skis were. I'm just like, oh, just make them big and send them out there. Like right. no big deal. But, but Marcus, after his face-to-face -to -face tour, he got in with a lot of people. He wanted to create the ski for these people. And I, f I feel fortunate that I've, like I'm with the team that has made that their passion as well. You know, it, it'd be one thing just to be buoy chasers and this stuff, but it's not everyone out there is a buoy chaser. Right. You know, a lot of people are just free skiers, like think of Glenn Plake, you know, the, right. the infamous Mohawk. He, I guess he was bugging Mar Marcus about, why are you guys doing all this buoy chasing? You're like, you guys don't have any fun. Like, you got to build this stuff so people can go out and, on the lake and have fun. Well, and it clearly was onto something. And it, it, yeah, and it, it kind of comes back a little bit to the college days of having the combination of not tournament, tournament skiers with world champions still in the dock one after another. And then, and then you do see some crazy stuff on the collegiate. I mean, I've seen slalom courses being run on a wakeboard. You yeah. Know, there, there's some, there's yeah. some rowdy stuff. Yeah. There is, yeah. First time ever going over a ramp would be college nationals. All right, yeah. Like, that's Classic. just a staple. Classic. <laughs> Classic you know. college skiing. <laughs> recruited, recruited on campus three weeks before. Oh, yeah, I skied on, on skis once at Dad's cabin what, 10 years ago. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> You're ready for nationals. You know, like, we need yeah. you. Are you able and willing? It's kind of like the exit seat talk. By the right. stewardess when you're on an airplane <laughs> are you able you, and willing to you never door? see bigger cheering that if by chance this jumper <laughs> lands land. it because you, you know, know you know first jump they're going to go out the back yeah or the side you know they're going to hit the ramp they don't realize it's like a sheet of ice <laughs> slip it out these trees and freeze right. just look at the trees close your eyes if you have to <laughs> don't move <laughs> <laughs> and then they land it oh my god that like cheer celebration yeah. you know like because that's there's a lot of because of this kind of recruiting yeah. there's a lot of people that that don't get the jump so no. let's say you get i don't know 20 people that don't land the jump and then you land it like you might you might as well be the last one of those who landed it but if you already brought 200 points to your team yeah boom it's hero amazing hero amazing. You know, like, <laughs> and then that gets you know the texas a m into third or whatever yeah, it is yeah. exactly like that's huge Exactly. But. No, it's, and you know, there's so many side of the sport that keep you, keep you hooked, you know, and yeah. you could be, you know, someone at your level, not at your level. Someone has never seen a boo in their life, but like th this sport it has a lot around it and, you know, within it. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the episode so far. Um, as you can imagine, we took a lot of breaks because we spoke for over four hours. So I'm taking the opportunity to use this break to tell you to subscribe to the Waterski Bits. If you haven't checked them out yet, you can find them on Spotify, on Apple. Uh, and what I'm doing with the Waterski Bits is essentially taking uh, the best parts or parts of interviews from the extensive vault by now that I have with the Waterski podcast and just Put them there five to ten minutes bits you know there's a uh, marcus talking about how the idea of the free ride came about rather than some of nick parsons ideas about skis uh, how robert ended up winning the panam game so there's a bit of um, extracts from the interviews that i've done so far now why would you want to subscribe to that well easier listening in terms of five to ten minutes and i will be posting parts of 1.0 interview with Will exclusively on the water ski bits. So these are not going to be bits taken from the three parts that you listen to this podcast, but stuff that he said and we spoke about uh, right before my computer decided to abandon us. So really, if there's an incentive to subscribe to the water ski bits, I would say that's the one uh, or the most recent one at least. So yeah, go, you can find the Water Ski Bits on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcast, and all the good other rest of apps. Break over, let's get back to the interview. So, look, Will, 
I just want to do something with you. You probably heard the two podcasts I did with Coop, um, or maybe not, but Coop. I listened to his first one, I think. Okay, so he did, we did a word association. That's your buddy that hasn't skied before, right? Right, yeah, yeah. exactly. And he's, you know, psych- soon to be psychologist. Yeah. So I want to play that game with you. Okay. And so basically, fairly simple. I'll, I'll just tell you a word, and you tell me the word that comes to mind, and then we'll sort of like unpack it. What do you say? Sure. Yeah? So the first word I have for you is uh, England. Beer. Beer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> simple. No. Maybe. England. Like, what's the first thing? Well, obviously beer came to mind. But yep. Probably because growing up, it was a very social thing, skiing, for me. Yep. You know, it was uh, Red the Lake in England, and if you've ever been to Lincoln, there's a ton of those touring uh, static caravans, like basically mobile homes along the side of the lake. I still haven't been. No. I really need to make it there's, up there. There's like maybe 30 of them combined uh, out of the two lakes around. But it'd always be, you know, you ski hard, you train hard in the day, and then at night it'll be you have a barbecue and you have a beer. Yep. And it was a very social, fun environment to be in. You know, you, 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 train, you train when you train and you play when you play. Do you miss that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I miss I miss that. Yeah, I. You know, if people ask me where's where's the my favorite place to ski in the world. It's going to be Hazelwoods, and you know it 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 it's a place where I spent my childhood basically. And I it was funny because traveling with Rob this summer, I was like trying to talk to him about things that happened in Hazelwoods. He's like, I wasn't even born. You know, I forget <laughs> how you know Rob's pretty young. You know, I, I remember before when the lakes were kind of combined and it was all flat. If you haven't been there, it's going to be hard to hard to explain. But then basically it turned into a, a place where building material, recycled building material, gravel, all that stuff, it, it got dumped there. And that's where the, the, the lakes got formed. And then there's huge banks at the end, you know, like yeah. 100 feet high and filled in lakes so I, I kind of saw the whole progress of that place from lakes to what it is today so you yeah. might have gone like hey rob do you remember when it goes dude yeah no, <laughs> no it's yeah it's really funny for me to bring that up but i have such vivid memories of every step of the way even like the i was obsessed with the bulldozers they had when they were you know backfilling or when they were moving stuff around because it was you know Two, three hundred lorries would come in there. Trucks would come in a day and dump stuff, and then the, it was a full operation. Right. And I was fascinated with that stuff. I loved the machinery. My granddad always had diggers and dump trucks and all these things. All these, I was obsessed. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's switch to the next word. Design. 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 Um, A1. A1. Yeah. A1 steak sauce. Oh, A1 steak sauce or A1 ski? Well, w- one of the other, other companies, when the A1 was released at Masters, said, if you buy a ski, we'll give you a free bottle of A1 steak sauce. So we won Masters that year with the A1, so that was pretty cool. But I think I say A1 because, for me, that was the first one that I was given behind the scenes access to what does the CAD look like what do the numbers go into it what's what are all the pieces involved in this design process what does the layout look like what's core thickness what type of core is being used what graphics are we going to use I love black right I like simplicity I want it to be raw I want it to be fast I want it to be all about performance you know Syndicate Pro A1 that kind of stuff yep um So that's what comes up for me. And, you know, that was first experience working with, you know, Bob and Dave. And at the time it was um, Matt Coldwell, I'm going to say, was like the CAD guy. I forgot. It's it's changed now. Now it's Jeff Shaw. We've got a new guy. But, yeah, I would say that. It won. Just because that was the first time I'd really, really been included. Okay. And every step of the way, questions asked, what do you think? You know, yep. it wasn't necessarily my design, but they still, 
thought enough of me to include me, which felt very special, and I think that will stick with me. Do you see yourself as a designer? Um, no. No. I'm a, I'm, I'm a curious being, I would say. I'm, I, I'm, still, I'm still plagued. Like, I haven't, I haven't locked a lot of doors, but I haven't unlocked, like, the 41 off door. And mm -hmm. I think that's where a lot of the curiosity still comes from. And it's been bugging me for a lot of years. I can definitely run the pass, but that's one thing. You know, I can, I can run 39 without a gate. You know, I even locked that door. That door is open, wide. Right. But it just, I think it just shows, I remember as a kid, it was like, if you can run a pass, I don't know, like five or six times back to back, you can run the next one. Remember that when people yeah, say yeah. that? Yeah, of course. That's not the case at 41. Like that doesn't mean shit. Like yeah. it's literally a completely different world. Like I, the ski yesterday where I, you know, I, I ski and I did the no gate thing. I put it on my Instagram. I didn't run 41 on that ski, but I can do a no gate gate on with that ski at 39. Right. So like, um, design, this is a weird sport. It's, it's, yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, good answer. Was it a good answer? Yeah, I liked it. I liked it. Yeah. And that's, that's the good thing about this word association technique. You know, you, you go wherever you go. Okay. Right? <laughs> Down the rabbit oh, hole. Let's keep going. Next one. Uh, pro skiing. Um, pro skiing. Pro skiing. Professional skiing. Confusing. Confusing. <laughs> uh, counterintuitive. Like when I think pro skiing, I think like performance, and then <clears throat> when I think performance, I think of all the things that go into performance and what it what it really takes to be able to stand on the start dock at a pro event and call yourself a pro skier. Right. It's it it becomes a really 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 big jigsaw puzzle. And sometimes it's easier to have like a like a five piece jigsaw puzzle than a million piece jigsaw puzzle. And basically the further I feel that I've gone down my career, the jigsaw puzzle just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually I think the hope is that all the pieces fall into place and you know that starts to make sense. Yeah. But um, for me, pro skiing has been one big jigsaw puzzle I'm trying to put it together and do you feel because i mean even with jigsaw puzzles you have techniques right like uh maybe yeah. you do the borders first and then you you do a little side with the same colors, colors or yeah right so certainly it sounds like you're the more you progress in your career the more you're seeing the complexity of it mm -hmm. but would you say that you have mastered some kind of like techniques to kind of attack these jigsaw yeah, def puzzles? definitely yeah, i mean i think the the board got turned upside down probably in 2006 when you know we've got a whole new team and then we're kind of left now it's on you to do it right essentially you know me plus a couple other people um and at that point yeah there wasn't really many of the jigsaw puzzles in place i had like my fitness i had my ability i had that was kind of it there wasn't a whole lot of other stuff in place. Didn't know much about skis, design. I wasn't even really into technique. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't even something I cared about. I was always, I got to where I was without really working on it that much. Yeah. I, I got called like the uncoachable kid because people would start talking. And if I didn't like what they were saying, I'd just stick my head in the water. <laughs> okay. I was like, ah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to hear it. Like that's just poison to my ears. Right. Like, I don't need to hear that. That w that's not along the lines of where we're going here. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was really a kid, my I'd be called Rubber Man. My un my uncle George would call me Rubber Man. <laughs> every time I skied, I had a different ski style. Uh, He's like, I go. don't understand. Like every time you go on the water, you look completely different. So it's like, oh, Rubber Man's gonna ski again. <laughs> right. But right. I guess that comes back to the jigsaw puzzles and over time. Mm -hmm. And you got like. You're speaking about this, like, 
not focus of technique in the past. So that suggests me that, however, recently you have been thinking about that. Yeah, I think the for for a lot of years, just out of necessity, is all about ski design and 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 learning as much as we could about that, trying as much stuff as we could. Um, kind of like running 39, it happened when I was young, so I knew I was capable of doing it. Also, that also happened with 41, like I ran 41 when I was relatively young. So I kind of, in my mind, I'm like, well, my technique's good enough, I just need to get something under my feet that's gonna make it more repeatable. Mm -hmm. Like just kind of stay this path, don't worry about that stuff. Like as you go along, you're gonna fine tune. But it kind of, kind of got to the point where there's a bit of a roadblock. You know, I just felt a little bit stagnant. And it was actually probably a chance encounter. I went down and skied in Miami, and I skied with Rocky Pasqua, Rocky and Laura down at Miami Ski Club. If you don't know them, um, he was like a big factor in Andy skiing for many years. And I, I kind of know why now, because <laughs> it's the the hard thing for me is to get somebody to question me, and I've I've kind of, it kind of sucks, but I want, sometimes I want people just to tell me how it is. Like, no, like, you're not Will Asher, you're just this guy and you're doing all this shit wrong and you just got to fix it. No. Um, and he was like the first guy I skied with that was so damn stubborn and he believed wholeheartedly that like, look, yes, you're good, but you're never going to be this unless you can kind of isolate a few of these factors and like clean some of this stuff up and take a different direction completely. Right. And that kind of happened in 2015, I would say. It was maybe one of the, f no, probably before that, 2011 or 2012, like one of the first times I skied with him. Mm -hmm. And if I look at myself from, and after that trip, I was kind of like, oh God, who's this guy? Like, kind of fuck him, you know, like in a way. Well, like, I mean, uh, understandable. You, you two times world champion. Who is this guy to come and yeah. tell you, you know, ah, if you don't change this, I you know. know. And I kind of left that place, but I had I always had the words ringing in the back of my head, you know. And it's, and I, I kind of got what he was saying, but I didn't really understand. It was a little bit like working with Bob for the first time when mm -hmm. he would say something. It was so advanced for me. I couldn't. My head wasn't there. My headspace wasn't right. I wasn't able to process it in the right way. And I kind of went home and I skied a bit and I was thinking about what he was saying and then I was. You know, just play with it. You know, a couple of times a set. So like, okay, here's what Rocky was saying. Let's try and hit on this a bit, hit on this a little bit. And one day, I remember I was like doing something with my legs. I was like, God, you know, I think that's what he was thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, or that's what he was trying to. That's what he saw in me that I was, you know, not exactly doing. Right. I, I gave him a call, and he was like, Yeah, dummy. <laughs> basically, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's basically what I was saying. Right. So it's we've kind of had that special relationship, and it seems to happen every time I ski with him. Cool. still the same story it's like he's not he's he's very good about that and it's it sucks for me because it really hurts my ego you know? mm. like any anytime your ego gets tacked you're kind of like right like, i don't want to hear that right now i just want to hear him great right you know i want to hear him good and rah. but he's like no it's like that's not why i'm here mm -hmm. like if you come and ski with me it's because you want someone that's strong enough to tell you you know Cause I can, I've been able to like bully or stick my head under the water or do things and right. just kind of get my own way. But it's funny how you like, not funny, but like you, it, it's interesting how you notice the discrepancy, right? Like on one hand, you know that you need those people to tell you as it is, Yeah. you know, and on, and parentheses aside, I pride of the fact that the first time I skied with you here, I actually was able, I don't know where I found the courage, honestly, but I was able to tell you, no, Will, I don't think you're doing this right or whatever. Yeah. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. And, and you, you were like kind of intrigued almost, you know, because as I said, as I was saying it, I'm like, what are you doing, Matteo? Like, <laughs> don't know. No, it's coming out. No, it's coming out. <laughs> you know, who are you to tell Will Asher to do his gate, you know? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I can see that. Like I've seen it personal experience how on one hand, you know that you need that. Yeah. But on the other hand, there's the ego part there. You know, I know how to do this. I've done it before. I've been successful. I am successful. Yeah. Who is this person to tell me? But then you know that you need the, the, not the poking, but like the the, the knowledge or the the you know the the pushing or whatever yeah. it is. You know. No, it's hard. It it's really hard to get that. It's really hard to find somebody or get, or get that person. It's, it's one thing to get someone that can bullshit you, 
Yeah. You know, they can they can tell you this stuff like, you know, you got to pressure your front foot more here or you've got to counter rotate, you know, like stuff that okay, yeah. Wh- whatever you read that in the magazine, but you know, when it it comes out in a way that's it's like mentally stimulating, you know, to the point of like ski design. It's like at a deeper level than, you know, yeah. Maybe I was able to think about it before. And there's no doubt it's like I think my the way I ski has completely changed, you know, since I met him. And I think he was like the kind of catalyst of that. Yeah. You know, he he kind of opened the Pandora's box and saying, okay, I think now it's okay to approach some other stuff. You know, your technique isn't all that, dude. <laughs> You're right. not all that good. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Okay. What was the, even the question? Uh, no, we're talking pro skiing. Oh, that, that was, was the word. Yeah. Okay. See, see how far you can go with wow, this, this word association yeah. thing. But thanks, Rocky. Appreciate yeah. you. And Laura, of course, because she's the rock. Next word. I don't have to focus that hard. <laughs> it's just, I'm just I'm putting worried. out. Next word, Nicole. Balance. Balance. Yeah. Hmm. We're like kind of in a way yin and yang in a way like i'm but which what she's been she told me more about balance than and anybody else as far as balance in life and mm-hmm. balance in um she kind of told me what it was to love or what it is to love um and that it doesn't like the way to succeed isn't always to do that that thing always Mm -hmm. you know sometimes you can gain inspiration from other places and other experiences that then it doesn't always have to be about the buoy count and about that that part of life you know it's it's about finding other things in life that can ultimately gain the whole experience or increase the whole experience yeah up and you can't do that by yourself you got to do that with a partner you got to share these experiences because they they really don't mean anything by themselves. I mean, some of my favorite, my, my best ones have been, my, or my best wins or achievements have been when I've been able to share them with her, especially. Whether it's like the first times, you know, when we go to masters, like the eight, nine, 10, she was, or nine and 10, especially she was there, you know, and it was like, it's always more fun to have that one person that you're one person to have those experiences with. Yeah. And then you told me that like, obviously she, be, she wanted to become integral part of the process. Mm-hmm. Right. Like she said, okay. I, like she saw need. Right. Yeah. And then she said, okay, I got to, got to she, help. She's such a confident person. I mean, she's, she's so different to me because she, I mean, she's a barefooter. So she was on like a Canadian barefoot team and that tells you a little bit about, you know, her, they're tough people. Right. But she's like this, she wants to go skydiving. I'm like, I don't want to jump out of a perfectly good plane. Like she is very, you know, she, she kind of seeks out these other things. She's, you know, she's not scared of a little bit of risk. Mm-hmm. Um, but she's also loves to take on a challenge. Like she's, she's, you know, she's never scared of a challenge. And she's like, Hey, I, I want to drive you or I think I can do it. Like no problem. And I was like, sweet. It's awesome. Like I'd love, I'd much rather have you drive me than, you know, somebody else that's some random, like you're going to be here. Right. And, um, yeah, so jumped in the boat right away and she just seemed to have a really good feel for the boat and just knowing her personality, she wouldn't quit until it was done or until she felt confident enough or she wasn't going to shy away from the challenge. Right. And she, she took it on like it was her own project. Like I never really told her or challenged her on what to do she would you know if i went and ski with somebody else she'd sit in the passenger seat she'd kind of watch me but then she'd be kind of watching the driver right and then afterwards we'll be driving home she's like you know whoever it was driving me i i kind of like the way he drove or with somebody else i didn't really like the way he drove i drive like this i'm going to try and 
play that kind of a technique into my driving. Mm -hmm. and, you know, she just took on that whole, that whole thing of, you know, she's very professional, professional with it. And it sounds like she, she taught you balance and also you've been applying that balance. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking the fact, you know, she's now in Miami doing, you know, med school rotations, yeah. which is a challenging part of a, a med student uh, career. Yeah. And you are now balancing your own act, going down there, you know, like being of support. Um, so definitely she's a good teacher. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And she, for, for what she's doing, it's essentially like she's a, she has to be a hundred percent committed. You know, you're not going to get through med school with, you know, you, you can't give up any of yourself really if you're going to make it through med school. Yeah. Like you've got to be a hundred percent committed and, and like everything I've seen her do in her life, whether it was the way she trained for barefooting or the way she, even simple things like the way she approached driving the boat for me was that same hundred percent commitment and dedication to whatever she had in front of her. Well, the path to get accepted to med school, I remember those days, you know, oh, yeah. we were doing all those things just to make sure she was, you know, yeah. it's a lot, a lot of details, a lot of crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Yeah. To yeah. get where she is. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. So I think this last word is, is well connected and uh, even just with what we sp talked about right now, but this is the last word of our word association mastery. I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> You don't want to get there? I'll let you know when I get there. Okay. Mastery. You know, the problem with skiing is it's, I don't think you can ever really master it. It's, there's always another one. Um, I, I think you can master certain aspects of it for now, but then who's to say that's not going to change in a week's time if a new ski design comes out or um, I, I don't, it doesn't seem attainable to me, mastery. Mm -hmm. So kind of not attainable. I don't know. Do you think anyone's mastered something? How, how, I mean, can I, can I flip it on you? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm, I guess I would, you know, you'd, you'd look at, some of what people have done in their life maybe like Roger Federer in tennis you're like well he mastered it but he doesn't win all the time so it's not like he really mastered it it's not like undefeated or is that what mastery means I have no idea I know but what so can I flip it on you sure okay. yeah I think the word that I would say and just even like from what you said but that, that the word that always comes to me is journey right which one journey 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 okay yeah like, travel yeah, travel, this thing, like, yeah. you know, yeah. like the process. This journey, yeah. So I don't know that mastery can be attained or achieved. As you said, like, I'll let you know when I get it. Yeah. And yet here you are doing your best to get somewhere close to that, yeah. right? Whatever that is, you know, what it is. Ski, like equipment, technique, mental game, you know, like knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, physical physical shape, nutrition, whatever it is, you're here still charging and still ch trying to go down that route, right? Yeah, I, I think because, because it's, a, it's a forever moving target. So if you look, if you asked me when I was like 15, what do I think mastery would be? I would say, well, if I could ever be number one in the world or a world champion or, you know, yeah. I'll marry a master's champion. I'll be like, that guy's a master. Like mm -hmm. hang it up basically right um but then that kind of happened pretty quick i'm like what do you do retire after skiing for a year or you know you kind of somehow you got to move the needle sometimes and i think that's what i struggled for for some years it's like i've kind of achieved everything i want to achieve if i do it again it's like is that really does it matter is, mm -hmm. is it is it gonna you know increase my happiness essentially. Yeah. So I guess I kind of shifted the goalposts along the way and it's become really about the process, about the journey. And I guess, yeah, ultimately that journey to mastery, 
and to me that's that's been a, a more more balanced more healthy way of doing it as well because to be on the win lose roller coaster if you if you hold every part of your being on that win lose roller coaster you're going to have a rough life yeah and i was on it for a lot of years but you know in the beginning it wasn't that bad it was like you know the win percentage was was up it was nice but then when the win percentage goes down if your ego is attached to that or you know your identity especially it can become really pretty rough right um but i think over time it's just kind of shifted and it's become more the process and then it actually comes back to being more healthy and it's like if you have speed on the gates two hand long and attack then the performance is there so it's like if i enjoy the journey along the way you know work on our ski stuff enjoy the people around me learning building together growing everyone around me and hopefully in the same way then that gets close to the mastery and that's the wins I, so so now i have more wins more frequently because it's not about win lose on a weekend it's about win on a day to day and if you if you lose on a day to day it's not doesn't really matter that much it doesn't hurt that much but yeah so it's more like okay like acquiring things constantly almost yeah in a way like not not for a for a selfish reason but like even just to understand like today you were out you you tried this thing you wanted to do on a ski you took three sets and you learned that either yeah that's the way or uh -uh, i was wrong that's a win but now for me even like and nicole kind of helped teach me about this it's not always about skiing like like the worst i i kind of realized more recently that the less i focus on it the better i get because i never used to focus on it that much Mm -hmm. like before it became all about design testing and um i kind of went deep down that rabbit hole to where i got obsessed and i couldn't even see past it but but now day to day maybe it's like you know i got go out on my bike and i can hold x power for you know an hour or an hour and a half or i can you know it's it's not even now it's not even about skiing it's about everything in life mm -hmm. so i and and the end result ends up being that my skiing gets better because it's it's there's not as much stress attached to it or it's not you know yeah. i have other things that i can gain my happiness or my value or my self worth yeah. yeah yeah my self worth is no longer attached to win lose yeah which isn't to say it's not a passion of mine but it's i'd say you know the win lose on a weekend is more a, an end result of the process and because if to really test the ski you've got to ski at 41 to run 41 essentially the process puts me to performance yeah so I don't have to worry about it because it's, it's built in by design. Whereas it used to be, I worried about it. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't worry about it, I thought it'd go away. But now it's like, no, it's just part of the design and it's part of the process. And that's better. That's more healthy for me. Well, we'll um, I came up with the word journey um, <laughs> because that's, that's what I could come up with. Um, what I can tell you is that I don't know that anyone will ever achieve mastery in water skiing or in any field. Yeah. Uh, but there are some people that strive hard and they're committed uh, and they really dedicate unimaginable amount of time and resources towards it. And at least right now in our sport, you come to mind for that. <laughs> so I'm super grateful that we got to do this. Um, really, it's been a true pleasure. Uh, and I know that people will enjoy it. I hope so. It's been it's been interesting to try and think about some of this stuff that's happened in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No, thank you. Cheers. Have a beer. Let's have a beer. <laughs>